And now we have the last uh, lecture of the conference, keeping you cool in extreme conditions, strategies to maximize performance, Paul Larsen. Paul Larsen is a lead of lab performance physiology in New Zealand. He's a scientist to support the triathlon team New Zealand. He spent a lot of time uh, of uh, studies about thermoregulation and hydration as is involved in our Congress, as in the first Congress in Alicante. Please. That's great. Thank you very much, Sergio. Uh, thank you very much to the organizing committee, the ITU, for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, so, yeah, the, the title of my presentation is uh, Keeping Your Cool in Extreme Conditions, as we've been speaking about, looking at strategies to maximize performance uh, in the triathlon. Um, and you can see the, um, I guess you can see Rachel Klamer and, uh, and Andrea Hewitt up there in the Gold Coast race. And you can see they're, they're working hard during the run. And it's interesting to me, I guess, just uh, their behavior as they're running maximally uh, midway through that, that 10 kilometer 10 kilometer run and just keep that in mind what they're doing right now as we go through the, the lecture here. Um, and as everyone will know here in the room, um, you know, and, and Andrea's coach is, was, was Laurent and um, Laurent was supposed to be here um, with us all today um, and the plan was that we were going to be working together and um, you know, looking at the plan towards, towards Rio, Andrea's plan. Um, so yeah, just, um, yeah, he's obviously really missed um, by myself, by all of us. Um, and I guess on behalf of New Zealand, uh, those of you that know Laurent, he'll, he'll often say he, he's 51% uh, French and he's 49% Kiwi. So I guess on behalf of, of New Zealand, um, I just wanna, yeah, we're, our, our heart is, is broken from this as well. Um, but Laurent would want us to go on, and, um, and Laurent was a, a great student of, of the sport, as, uh, as Joel was talking about with, with Simon. So, um, and, and Laurent was off, often asking me about this question, uh, how do we maximize performance in the heat? So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my background in history. And that started um, after I finished my PhD in Australia, and I worked with this fellow up here on the screen. His name's Dr. David Martin. He's a, a physiologist, um, a fairly well-known physiologist, uh, applied sports scientist, um, works for the, worked for the AIS for quite a long time, and, the, and now he's a, um, a, a sports scientist with uh, the Philadelphia 76ers in the States. But anyways, um, when I first met Dave, um, I was, uh, he, he, he wanted to, figure out a way to maximize the performance of, of um, a couple of the cyclists um, going to the Athen Athens games. And he told this story about the Atlantic, Atlanta games um, to me, and it's, he tells it obviously way better, but um, the story was that you know, a lot of athletes don't think they necessarily go any worse or, or better, in, better in the heat, they just kind of do the same. So he, you know, we, I guess back in the, around the Atlanta games, they, they wanted to get that, make that clear. So it came down to the final six guys that were gonna make a short list um, of three that were gonna perform in the Atlanta Olympics. So these guys are highly motivated. And um, they, yeah, they performed, a, you know, they went to Dave and they said, yeah, we're, you know, we, we're rock solid in the heat, our performance won't, won't go bad, pick us. And, um, and he said, yeah, okay, we're gonna test you in 23 degrees Celsius, and we're gonna test you in 32 degrees Celsius. And he uh, on, on, you know, randomized that out. And um, uh, you can see the data there. They, um, they went, uh, in terms of their, their power output, it was down 6.5% uh, in 32 degrees. So even in um, some of the best top, top cyclists in the world at that time, Heat matters, their you know, performance declines. Okay, so that was kind of established. Um, I guess I, at this point, I just wanna 
take you through a little bit of a video uh, that was done by the Catalyst program. It's about uh, two, two and a half minutes in length, and it just talks about some of the work um, around that we did uh, around, around the heat. 250 kilometer road race. I love it, that's what I do. That's, that's why I'm here. <laughs> it's my job, I've done it since I've, I'm six. I think the biggest week I've done is about 1,500 kilometers. Michael Rogers, who is a really nice combination of uh, blessed with genetics and matched with fierce determination. Inside, he's a real fighter, he loves to win. A year ago, Mick and Dr. David Martin made a reconnaissance trip to Beijing and didn't miss the opportunity to film the Olympic course. It's a gruelling race through the outskirts of Beijing along the Great Wall of China, climbing hills and negotiating steep descents. No other country has this priceless footage. And they've linked the footage via computer to a bike ergometer. Mick is experiencing the same pedal resistance as he would if he was actually there. And if that isn't enough, the weather conditions are also the same. Well, I'm about to go from a pleasant Canberra temperature to Beijing conditions. Oh, well, it's... Um, 35 degrees in here apparently and about 60% humidity. Now I have to tell you I'm feeling breathless just standing here and I don't have to exercise flat out. What's more I don't have to wear one of these. Don't ask me where it goes. In these extreme conditions Mick's body temperature and hydration are carefully monitored. 37, 38 degrees Celsius is comfortable. When the core temperature gets up over 40 degrees Celsius, there's very, very strong feedback to the brain to tell the body to shut down. We are too hot. In this heat, Mick could sweat well over an astonishing three liters per hour. So how does he stay cool and hydrated? to the Australian Institute of Sports, a secret potion. It looks like a Slurpee. Well, that's exactly what it is, a concentrated way to eat ice. It's going to act as a heat sink and it's going to make you much cooler. But the so I'll leave it there for a moment and we'll get back to that. Um, so some of the information I want to tell you here today is, um, was already um, put together nicely uh, by the INSEPT group um, who organized a heat, stress, and sport performance conference um, back in June. And um, yeah, I just, uh, I'll try to basically um, provide a synopsis of all of the main recommendations in the, um, the context of the triathlon, how you coaches and athletes can, can use that, uh, prepare for heat optimally. So yeah, the, the, and this is a lot of these same authors that were at the heat conference um, were uh, um, put a, a series of papers together in, in terms of those the consensus recommendations. The very first one, um, as we've uh, as I spoke about with um, with Dave and his cyclists, is that exercising in the heat induces um, thermal regulatory and other physiological strain um, that leads to impairments in exercise capacity. So, in the heat, in those extreme conditions that Sergio was mentioning, um, the you know, your performance will, will suffer um, at an individual level. Um, and there's a variety of different systems around the body that may be providing that strong feedback back to the brain to tell the body to slow down. So whether it's, you know, signals from the guts, um, central cardiovascular adaptation or um, signals, um, something going on at the muscle level, um, or the, you know, but all providing feedback back to the brain to say uh, we need to slow down because we're going to um, we're going to make we're going to damage ourselves this is my mate um, Daniel Plews who's a fellow physiologist in the with the New Zealand rowing squad and he's a he's a pretty solid Ironman triathlete as well he, he, this is him uh, along a leaky drive in Hawaii just just recently um, at the Hawaiian Ironman and 
he, where he placed uh, 44th overall, one of the top age groupers. Um, so it is a pretty, pretty good picture of him in, in a lot of agony. And I, I guess I just wanted to ask that, the question to the audience. Just throw out any, any words. What, is, um, what impairs performance in the heat? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Dehydration. Dehydration. Awesome. Cheers. Thanks, Barry. So absolutely, hydration status is the very first thing that comes to your mind. Um, and it, it often comes to my mind as well. It used, used to come to my mind often too. If we look at um, a, a lot of um, information that's out there um, from many of the, um, I guess, uh, industries that are, that are providing that information, um, here's one example. Uh, the effect of dehydration on performance um, says this, um, this academic from the Gatorade Sports Science Institute, that a lack of water in the body will inhibit your sweating and uh, cause your body temperature to rise, make you hotter, and ultimately reduce your, um, your ability to exercise. So um, that's one of the things I wanted to test when I was kind of um, an academic in, in Australia at Edith County University in Perth. And this was the first study when, when these I wanted to test the hypothesis that you did get hot when you, um, uh, when you dehydrated, when you lost body mass. And this was right around the time that these uh, core temperature pill uh, devices were coming out where you could actually just swallow a pill and it would measure your internal temperature. So um, one, of the thi things that, one of the first things that we did is we took, a, took this system out to the Bustleton Ironman Triathlon um, in, around Perth and we, we, we gave all the athletes the pills, and then we, were, and we ran around the course taking their, their temperature, basically. And we, we found out, we, we, we measured their body mass, and we saw what their temperature was. And it was about 35 degrees or so, or sorry, tw um, 25 degrees, so mild conditions, but still dehydrating and, and getting hot. And this is the, this is the data from, from the field conditions. And, and you'll notice that um, the temperature is not that... Um, that, that substantial. The, it was just kind of hovering around 38 degrees, and these guys all lost over th more than 3% of their body weight. And just to give you an idea what 3% looks like, it's about, so on me, it would be about, about two liters. So I'll just hold up these bottles. That's, that's, about, that's about three liters. That's about three liters, sorry, 3%, two liters. On you. Quite, a lot of, quite a lot of fluid but temperature is not that big a deal. So the body's, the body's figuring things out. So that, yeah, the conclusion was that despite um, reductions to bo in body mass to 3%, um, core temperature remained about one degree Celsius above resting and, and no real relationship with hydration status. So that was a bit odd for us and kind of a bit, a bit myth busting, but we wanted to take it a little bit further. So we took it, um, we, we, we went back to our lab and we, um, we did a, Basically, the, the idea was that, well, maybe a lot of these studies are being influenced by the fact that people know their hydration status because they're, in all the other studies, they're, they're told exactly how much to drink, and it's pretty hard to blind hydration status. And the other thing we noticed was that when all the different laboratory studies, there was um, you know, still wind conditions. It was like you're at a spinning class or something, which was a lot different than that picture there where we saw the cyclist who's out, on the, um, uh, you know, out, out in the field conditions. So we, we did two things. We, we, um, we dehydrated them to 3% uh, of their body mass, the same amount. And then we rehydrated them with um, the bags of saline so they, became, you know, they got back to their normal body mass. Um, but we did it in a blind, blinded fashion. So we left them either 3% dehydrated, 2% dehydrated, or um, right back to normal. And they didn't know what they were at. They couldn't tell. And we put a big fan in front of them as well. And we, we, um, we got them to do a 25-kilometer time trial in hot conditions. And what did we find? Power was the same right across the board. If they didn't know what their hydration status was, and, they were, and the, there was a fan that was kind of cooling them, just like you cycle and run in outdoor conditions, per, the brain figured things out. This was not a big player. So although that is our perception, the data, the current data really doesn't support the fact that hydration status is a big player, at least to 3%. Okay, so yeah, no, no difference in 25-kilometer time trial performance in the heat um, with blinded dehydration 
to 3% and a wind speed at 32 kilometers an hour, like you'd experience in the field. So again, um, with respect to hydration, and this was concluded by Jim Cotter, who gave the presentation on hydration status, um, and, and this came out as a, in a paper as well. Um, our interpretation of the literature on dehydration is despite its widespread um, advice regarding the acute dangers, uh, the findings have limited relevance um, to free living individuals with access to food and water. All right, so if you got fluid present, you're gonna be, you're gonna be pretty all right. Um, so ad libitum drinking, um, drinking to thirst, uh, does seem appropriate in most exercise and environmental settings. Okay, so if you're listening to your, your brain and you're listening to what it's telling you in terms of how much to drink and it's around, pr pretty good chances you're going to be fine and you're going to be safe, obviously. Going beyond 3%, uh, it's a lot of fluid though, then we've got to pay attention, a little bit more attention probably. So moving on now, we care about performance here. We're united by the, the fact that we're, we're trying to go fast um, well, what, what, is, what, is, what are the factors affecting performance in the heat? We know that heat changes the game so to, um, a little bit. So um, what's, what's kind of going on? What's, what are the, the mediators? So this comes from uh, just, uh, it's been kind of spoken about with the central governor model. model. Um, so yeah, the, if, and from this paper and from the central governor model, um, we've got, um, I guess, feed forward, you telling your body to do something, and feedback systems, um, all the signals in the body that are feeding back to that brain saying, oh, that's enough, okay? And again, as mentioned, when you add heat to that formula, as we're going to do in both possibly in Rio and most certainly in Tokyo, things change a little bit. We've got a new, a new big player that we've got to pay attention to. So the, I guess we, the, the main things that heat affects that, um, uh, on that feedback, extent of fluid loss, probably to 3%. Um, so beyond 3%, that's really gonna, we're probably gonna be, that's gonna be a bigger factor. Um, thirst, if you're feeling thirst, that's, uh, that, that's probably gonna be feeding back negative. The rate of heat accumulation, so how fast heat is accumulating in, in your body either through a lack of convective cooling, through um, uh, UV radiation, uh, the ambient temperature, um, humidity, um, and then also the increase, I'm sorry, and also the metabolic heat, so the speed at which you're going, all right? You, if you're working harder, that's gonna add more heat load to you. And then the rate of the, the RPE increase, um, how, how um, that rating of perceived exertion feels. And then the feed-forward ones that are going to influence your performance are going to be your motivation, all right? um, belief in what you're doing, your prior experience, um, and then finally the last one would be cooling. Okay, so let's start with the first one. Um, the first thing that you should probably do, and that's again coming from the INSEP conference and, um, and others, um, the, rec the main, main recommendation, the most important thing you can do is, as Yan uh, nicely presented to us, is, is um, ad um, adopt, sorry, the most important thing you can do to adopt, um, to reduce physiological strain and maximize your performance is to heat acclimate. And we saw a great example of that from, from Yan. Um, and there's these heat camps that are all over the globe. Um, so these involve, these involve uh, multiple exposures to the heat, 30 to 90 minutes per session on average, or being in that environmental work fine too. And they're characterized by an expanded thermoregulatory range and increased capacity to dissipate or remove heat. Okay, and Jan presented some examples of this going on, but here is... Um, uh, this is from Julian Perriard's uh, work where we can see a lot of the different things that are going on over 14 days. Um, so you've got, uh, a, you know, we've got an increase in the, the plasma volume there in the blue. Um, your heart rate is going down quite quickly over seven days, lower heart rate. Um, your exercise capacity continues to go up. That is in the green. Um, so we've got thermal comfort, it's feeling easier in, uh, in the black over consecutive days. Um, skin and core temperatures are diminishing. Um, and the, the other, I guess the other one that, um, 
that doesn't get talked about too much, but there's, there's also some things going on with the actual proteins in your body. They're called heat, um, heat shock proteins, and they're just making it um, more resistive to that, to that heat. They're sucking in the heat almost. Um, and that's going to be one we'll have to consider a bit further with respect to the Tokyo one. How, in these extreme conditions, how much does that chronic training in the heat assist us to maximize performance? Uh, and I should say these are not all, as, as Jan showed, not, not the be-all, end-all. This is what's going on, but they dissociate away from performance. But that's what happens with heat acclimation. So the cool thing about heat acclimation is that it ticks a lot of these boxes. So heat acclimation will um, lower the extent of your fluid, fluid loss um, because you're retaining more plasma volume, right? That plasma volume is, is sucking in there. There's all these things going on with your kidney, the renal adaptations that are making you retain more fluid. Um, you're, and because of that, you're not as thirsty, so feeling better about it. It's all those things are helping with the rate of heat accumulation. You're not gaining heat as fast because you've got all these ways to, um, to mitigate that, the fact that you're gaining heat. Um, and all of that um, helps with the, how it feels, for how exercise feels. It's certainly affecting things like belief from the psychological models. It's giving you prior experience in the heat, um, and which, you know, altogether that will give you motivation. So um, it's helping with, with the exception of cooling. Like cooling is actually, that's where we'll go next, but cooling would be something that you can, you can do. So this is something that's in your control. It's next on the radar. And I've had, um, uh, again, some, some experience in this from the video. I was helping Dave, and that was Louise Burke as well, with a, a, a whole series of pre-cooling um, exercises to, to maximize performance, which I'll take you through now. So in case you didn't know, pre-cooling is the, the process of lowering one's body temperature uh, prior to performance. Um, and the, what you're trying to do is you're, you're trying to raise the heat sink capacity or the amount of heat that you can take into your body. Um, and of course, in the, in the high performance or any performance setting, it's, it's got to be practical, or it or it's does, just doesn't get done. It's just theory. The f and again, back to, back to the video, the f one of the first, when I first met Dave, we were looking uh, at optimizing performance for the Athens games, and we came up with the fact with we were going to um, put people in a plunge pool, and then we were going to make them wear an, an ice vest on the way to the, uh, their major event. For, this is for Michael Rogers in the time trial uh, for Australia, um, and then before they perform. And we basically showed in that study that the series of these, um, you know, basically the cooler we could make our athlete with a combination of the two, the better it, um, uh, the athlete performed. And we, did a, we actually used that with a modification, um, and Michael Rogers got a, got a bronze. In, the, in that games. Then moving on to Beijing, this was the next, the next string of, uh, of, of work that we did. The discovery that ice slushy could be very beneficial because of this thing, this big fancy word called the um, enthalpy of fusion, right? Where um, you get when, um, uh, when, when a substance changes its state from solid to liquid or liquid to gas, there's a, an added um, energy, heat energy that is needed for that process. Okay, so um, in the case of slushy, obviously it's, it's, a, it's a solid going to, to a liquid as it melts in you and it takes that heat away from your body. So again, it raises that heat sink capacity. And we showed that in, uh, in this paper here where we, um, we ingested about 500 mils, a half a liter of ice slushy for in the 30 minute period prior to performing and it lengthened the time to exhaustion in the heat by 20% or, or 10 minutes to exhaustion, running it at your, at your first ventilatory threshold. And um, Louise and colleagues um, at the Beijing Olympics used that with the Australian team. Um, yeah, and they're made all, not just raising the heat sink capacity probably, but maybe there's something also going on um, with, the, with respect to where that um, ice, Cold, um, cold fluid is being ingested. Maybe the fact that it is being ingested right at the mouth level around the, the brain and the, and the core, this region, where there's lots of different receptors, maybe that's ma that matters. So, yeah, possibly, so it's, it's definitely lowering core temperature. Um, it's definitely increasing the heat storage capacity, how much heat you can, you can put in your body. But maybe it's, maybe it's lowering brain temp temperature because of the proximity. 
Um, and yeah, again, sensors in the mouth, uh, esophagus, GI tract, and the hypothalamus in the brain. So all those things ma that, um, that matter. Uh, just going back to the Hawaii, uh, the, sorry, the Hawaii Ironman, and if you watch Ian Ferdino and, um, and his performance, he was, it was quite something to watch him on the run and as he went through and he grabbed every time he went through one of the aid stations, um, he, would, he, would sig he would signal that he wanted a nice cold um, one of these, whole, the whole thing from, the, from a bucket sitting in ice. And he'd grab that and he would, um, it wouldn't drink that much, but he would pour that right, right all over his head, you know, aiming to, to cool his brain. And again, there's Andrea doing the same thing. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there's Andrea doing the same thing. Um, and a little plug for my small invention. This is called the flow bottle. And this is the, um, basically, I, when I went to high performance sport, we didn't have um, a nice slushy dispenser. And I, uh, and I wanted to, to try to do this, this pre-cooling maneuver during the cycle phase. Um, and because there, was, there were no water bottles with, um, that you, know, you could actually get ice slushy out of and that would be um, thermally insulating, um, I worked with a group that invented that, so to make it a little bit more practical. Inigo's used that with uh, Escadel, uh, his cycling team in the Tour de France, um, and Martin uses that uh, nicely with the, um, the uh, Paris Saint-Germain team. So, uh, and it's uh, Chris Stevens from Australia has done a nice PhD project on that, where he showed that during a 40-kilometer um, 40-kilometer um, bike. Uh, you can see him, uh, the, they lower the, um, the core temperature, the esophageal temperature, or sorry, the, the, yeah, the, the core temperature, and um, improve their running performance there um, in the heat. So to conclude, or I guess to take the main recommendations from the heat, stress, and per sport performance conference, um, this, this is the take home things. Um, first of all, train well. Don't, um, we've talked about all these different things you can do for the heat, but first and foremost, don't forget about the training program. Um, that's, first and, that's always got to be the most important thing. Um, after that, prepare in the heat or use heat acclimation strategies. Use pre-cooling that is practical. It's got to make sense. Um, ice slushy or cold fluids for, for internal co cooling makes a lot of sense. Um, fluids at ad, ad libitum or thirst are, are more than adequate. Um, you know, practice, so whatever, um, yeah, whatever you decide to do, make sure you practice. Believe in what, what you actually practice. Coaches sell whatever you're doing to your athletes, so they, you know, they're believing that this is the most important thing that you can do. Um, yeah, and, and I guess the, the, um, the general message is that the cooler you feel, the better you'll perform. Quite simple, but useful. So Rio is going to be potentially very hot. Um, as it's been told, Tokyo is going to be ridiculously hot. Um, yeah, and I guess just uh, in memory of, of Laurent, um, and I, just one last story with Laurent. Uh, he always said that uh, I, I asked him one what one time what, what motivates him and why he's doing what it is that he, that he does with both being an athlete and a coach. And he said that it's, it's just this, um, it was the, the, the relentless pursuit of the perfect performance. He said, Paul, I want, I want to find that perfect performance. It's just, it burns inside of me. And I think so many of us in the room share that as well. And um, yeah, Laurent would want that to continue. So thank you.